Hello, I'm David Welch. I teach at the University of Waterloo. And today I would like to try to answer the question, what can Canada and Japan do to lower the dangers of war in Taiwan and the South China Sea? Now, Taiwan and the South China Sea are generally considered two of the most dangerous flashpoints in the world at the moment. Uh, certainly two of the most dangerous flashpoints in East Asia. And it's not difficult to imagine that one or the other could potentially be the scene of the outbreak of a major confrontation, particularly between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Now, Canada and Japan are not uh, direct core players in East Asian security matters for a few reasons. For Japan, it's a legacy of the wartime experience and Japan's adoption of the so-called pacifist constitution, which has uh, resulted in uh, limitations on Japan's ability to participate actively in uh, so-called hard power or kinetic military operations uh, for reasons other than self-defense. Uh, for Canada, it's quite simply a function of the fact that Canada is on the other side of the Pacific and does not have much physical military presence in the uh, western part of the Pacific. But nevertheless, Canada and Japan could potentially play important roles in helping to avoid conflict in either uh, Taiwan or in the South China Sea. And that is what I would like to talk to you about uh, right now. Uh, let me begin uh, by saying that Canada and Japan actually have a long history of cooperation in security matters. Uh, as a result of the Anglo-Japanese alliance, for example, in 1902, during World War I, it was the Imperial Japanese Navy that had responsibility for securing the British Columbia coast against possible German attack. And as a result, the Imperial Japanese Navy sent uh, military vessels to help uh, guard the British Columbian coast. This is one of them. It's uh, the, uh, a, a Japanese armored cruiser called the Asso, which is here seen docked in Esquimalt in British Columbia during World War I. More recently, Canada has actively been participating in Operation NEON, which is a multilateral effort to enforce sanctions against North Korea. These are UN imposed sanctions against North Korea. And here you see one of Canada's new, relatively new frigates, as well as a CP-140 Aurora anti-submarine patrol craft. And uh, one of the helicopters that's attached to the frigates uh, deployed in the Western Pacific monitoring uh, for illicit North Korean behavior. And um, it's highly appreciated in the region that Canada has actually been participating in Operation Beyond, and it's one of the efforts Canada can make to boost its security profile in the region. Now, if there is a conflict that breaks out, uh, say between the United States and China, a lot of international relations theorists think that it might be as the result of a dynamic that many associate with the ancient Greek writer uh, Thucydides who wrote uh, extensively on the outbreak and conduct of the second Peloponnesian war. And a common reading of Thucydides is that he thought that the war broke out between Athens and Sparta in that conflict as a result of the rise of Athens and the fear that this caused in Sparta. So this uh, reading of the Peloponnesian wars has inspired what we call power transition theory in international politics. And the idea is that if there's a rising power that threatens to supplant an established leader or a hegemon uh, in the system, then the uh, likelihood is fairly high that the declining power will take action to try to prevent the rising power from supplanting it. Or potentially the rising power might issue a challenge to try to overtake the declining power as the leader of the system. This is, in my opinion, a poor reading of Thucydides, and I have written quite extensively on this topic, uh, the so-called Thucydides trap as a source of conflict in East Asia, I do not find compelling. Mostly for the reason that it's uh, fairly clearly in nobody's interest, and certainly not in the interest of the United States or the People's Republic of China to get involved in a major shooting war. Uh, so the Thucydides trap idea suggests that war would be likely to break out between the United States and China as the result of a simple rational calculation of costs and benefits. Either the rising challenger 
would think that the time is ripe to supplant the declining hegemon, or the declining hegemon would think that the benefits of taking action against the rising challenger now outweigh any potential costs, particularly the costs of waiting until later when the rising challenger has become more important. As I say, I don't think this is a compelling story of the likely outbreak of a conflict between the United States and China because we're not in ancient Greece. We're in a modern globalized world in which uh, the United States and China are deeply and intimately interconnected uh, economically, technologically, in a wide variety of ways. And it would be tantamount to shooting oneself in the head for either country to uh, actually deliberately strike out against the other uh, under most reasonable circumstances. At least it's very difficult to imagine the circumstances that would make that kind of calculation seem rational and compelling. But that's not the only way wars break out, not just as a result of rational calculation. There's at least three other pathways to war and there are historical examples of each of them operating. I like to call these the push, pull and stumble pathways. A push pathway to war would involve domestic pressure, essentially forcing a leadership group uh, to take stronger action than they might otherwise wish to do. Classic example of the push pathway in action was the 1898 Spanish-American War. And uh, here you see a little picture of President McKinley, who at the time uh, did not have any particular appetite for war with Spain, but as the result of Spain's brutal policies uh, in Cuba, trying to put down an independence movement and an insurrection there against Spanish colonial rule, uh, the American public became outraged by stories of atrocities committed by the Spanish against Cuban independence forces. And there was effectively a, a domestic clamor for war. So uh, McKinley yielded to that and the result was uh, wholesale defeat of Spain and the United States suddenly found itself in possession of Spanish territories all around the globe, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Philippines, and so on. Certainly not planned from the outset by President McKinley or his administration. A pull pathway to war is where one's commitments to other countries essentially drag you into a conflict that they are in. And a classic example of the pull pathway at work is the Vietnam War. And here we see President Lyndon Johnson who committed the United States to come to Vietnam's defense in 1965, South Vietnam's defense, because South Vietnam was an American ally and security client. And uh, South Vietnam was not doing well in its conflict with North Vietnam and with domestic uh, National Liberation Front insurgency in the southern part of Vietnam. So the United States has effectively found itself dragged into a conflict that it otherwise probably would have tried to avoid. And a stumble pathway is where uh, leaders miscalculate and they misunderstand the situation, misperceive it, think they have certain advantages that they do not have. Essentially, they find themselves in a war by mistake. And my favorite example of a war resulting from the stumble pathway is the 1982 Falklands Malvinas War in which the last military junta in Argentina uh, rather brashly invaded a British possession off the coast of Argentina, the Falkland Islands, and occupied it, uh, miscalculating that they could actually get away with it. Uh, and uh, the purpose, of course, was to try to resolve a longstanding sovereignty dispute with Britain or who rightfully owned the Falkland Islands. But the result was a war that uh, Argentina lost quite significantly. And it resulted in the downfall of the junta. They spent jail time. And uh, I suppose the silver lining of that conflict was that Argentina finally had an opportunity to become democratic. So these are three different pathways to war. And I, I think it's important to realize that in any particular flashpoint, Taiwan or the South China Sea, one has to consider the possibility or the danger that any one of these pathways may result in conflict. 
Now, if you're going to try to anticipate the sources of danger for conflict anywhere, you're certainly going to want to try to cultivate empathy with the likely parties to that conflict. And here I want to stress that in my view, empathy is a very important, understudied and underappreciated concept in international security studies. And by empathy, I simply mean the capacity to understand another's view of the world. And we use different ways of trying to express this. For example, we talk about putting oneself in somebody else's shoes or seeing the world through somebody else's eyes. However you want to put it, the uh, advantages of empathy are many. Because if you can understand how someone else sees the world, you can better anticipate how they think and how they might calculate. Empathy really does require that you try to figure out what somebody else wants, what somebody else needs, what they fear, what they believe. If you have this kind of information, you can do a better job of piecing together a likely decision-making process that they might go through that would lead them potentially to a decision to use military force to solve a dispute. Now, empathy isn't always going to decrease the likelihood of conflict. So suppose, for example, that you actually underestimate the threat that some country poses. Well, if you underestimate it and you improve your empathy, you're actually going to increase the likelihood of conflict because you'll appreciate all the more strongly that this potential adversary is a real threat. On the other hand, if you overestimate threat, as is often the case, then if you can increase empathy, you can probably do a good job of decreasing the risk of conflict. Uh, empathy in this case will help you find ways of you know, assuaging the nerves or satisfying the needs or gratifying the wants of somebody who you think poses a potential threat. So empathy can cut both ways, but either way, it's uh, probably better to know more about your potential adversary than less. And the costs of not cultivating empathy can be quite high. So here, for example, we have a classic case of someone who did not adequately cultivate empathy with a potential adversary. Up there on the left is British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, uh, who probably thought he could avoid a major war in Europe by simply accommodating what Adolf Hitler had been demanding in a limited way in 1938. Turned out that Adolf Hitler was not really appeasable. He was bent on conquest, keen on at some point actually starting a second world war. And so Chamberlain's efforts failed. Uh, would a greater degree of empathy actually have helped avoid World War II? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, but it certainly would not have hurt for Chamberlain to know more about Hitler rather than less. Right below Chamberlain, I've put a photo of the Canadian Prime Minister at the time, William Lyon Mackenzie King, who famously was hoodwinked by Hitler and completely failed to understand what was on Hitler's mind. After meeting Hitler, King came back and wrote in his diary that he thought Hitler had uh, kind eyes and was fond of dogs, but was not a major threat to world peace. It turned out to be completely wrong. In contrast, uh, the end of the Cold War was generally considered a very dangerous time because the Soviet Union was collapsing and falling apart in 1990. And uh, a lot of analysts, a lot of international relations specialists thought that that was a particularly dangerous time because of the potential uh, for active military resistance within the Soviet Union to the end of the Soviet empire, the possibility that there would be inadvertent conflict between Soviet and NATO forces as the Cold War was coming to an end because of the instability and the unpredictability and the uncertainty that that involved. But fortunately, both US President Ronald Reagan and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher managed to cultivate quite a high degree of empathy with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, very quickly, even though they didn't see eye to eye politically on very much, these three leaders uh, reached a shared understanding of the dangers of 
soft of, of the Cold War coming to an end and the importance of trying to find a way to bring it to a soft landing. And they did so successfully, ultimately. Uh, Reagan, of course, was not president when the Cold War came to an end. Um, president George H.W. Bush was. Uh, but it was sort of the, the road on which Reagan put the United States in its Soviet policy that made it possible for the Cold War to come to a, a peaceful um, end. Now, with all that by way of background, let's talk a little bit about Taiwan. Taiwan, as you probably know, is a de facto independent state. It's completely self-governing. It's democratic. Uh, it's one of the world's most important economies. And yet it is claimed by the People's Republic of China as an unrecovered lost province. And it is the official stated policy of the People's Republic of China that Taiwan must come back into the fold. In other words, at some point, the People's Republic of China must rule Taiwan. It must become an integral part of the country governed by Beijing. Uh, this is a prospect that the Taiwanese are not interested in uh, because the Taiwanese, among other things, uh, have a thriving uh, society and a thriving politics already. They are democratic. They have no interest in being ruled by an authoritarian uh, regime in Beijing, no interest in being so-called part of a communist country. And they've seen what's happened, for example, recently in Hong Kong, which had uh, quite extensive autonomous uh, government. And in fact, Beijing had pledged way back in the 1980s that when Hong Kong reverted to the People's Republic of China as the British lease expired in 1997, that uh, Beijing would respect Hong Kong's autonomy for 50 years. Well, that hasn't happened. Beijing has effectively cracked down on Hong Kong's autonomy, uh, crushed its democracy movement, crushed its free press, uh, disqualified anybody from running for office in Hong Kong who is not a quote, patriot, unquote, and the Taiwanese uh, can see that this would be their fate as well if the uh, People's Republic of China effectively uh, conquered Taiwan. Um, the Taiwanese, crucially, don't really think of themselves much anymore as Chinese. So back in the day, in the end of World War II, the dominant view in Taiwan would have been, yes, that Taiwan is in fact part of China, but part of the Republic of China not part of the People's Republic of China. And uh, when the Republic of China effectively uh, lost to the People's Republic and forces, uh, the nationalists lost to the communists in the Chinese Civil War in 1949, uh, the remaining nationalist forces retreated to the island of Taiwan. Um, claimed initially and for a very long time that they were still the rightful government of all of China. But as time went by um, and Taiwan got on with its own life, that inclination began to fade. And as you can see from this chart, uh, over time, this is only from 1994, but it's still quite a dramatic shift. Taiwanese increasingly identify only as Taiwanese. They don't identify as both Chinese and Taiwanese. And the proportion of people who identify as Chinese only in Taiwan has shrunk very dramatically. So obviously this is a, a trend, these are trends that are going to continue. Uh, it's a generational change in part. The young people in Taiwan have no recollection of ever being part of China, no interest in being part of China. And there's uh, no prospect that the Taiwanese would ever deliberately choose to rejoin the mainland. And yet, as I say, People's Republic of China, uh, as an official policy, insists that Taiwan must, in fact, come back to the fold, must be united with the mainland. And recently, President Xi Jinping has been making statements to that effect that sound as though they have a degree of urgency to them. It's entirely possible that bringing Taiwan back into the fold is something he sees as a legacy issue. 
and he wants to he wants to go down in history as the person who made that happen. So this is obviously a dangerous situation. <clears throat> Taiwan isn't going to do it voluntarily. That means the only way Taiwan is going to be brought back into the fold is through coercion. And uh, economic coercion may be one mechanism the People's Republic would be willing to use, but there's not much sign that that's going to work, which probably means that if mainland really does want to absorb Taiwan, it'll have to be done militarily. But for the most part, Beijing's key goal is to try to prevent Taiwan from officially declaring independence and sort of officially relinquishing its own position that the rightful government of all of China is in Taipei at the moment, not in Beijing. And the Taiwanese, of course, have a, a government that is, um, its official policy is that Taiwan is actually already functionally an independent state. And uh, that Taiwan has never in fact been part of the People's Republic of China, which is true. And what Beijing fears immediately is that other countries around the world will begin to recognize Taiwan as a sovereign independent state. And Beijing has made it clear that that's a red line, that if uh, Taiwan pushes independence too far, that will trigger harsh countermeasures, likely in the form of military action. So very recently, the Chinese, in fact, have been ramping up military flights around uh, Taiwan in response to what they perceive as moves by Taiwan and others to push the envelope when it comes to claiming or recognizing Taiwanese sovereign independence. These flights, by the way, take place in Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And it's important to recognize that the Chinese have not been flying military aircraft into Taiwanese sovereign airspace. In other words, they've been avoiding flying closer than 12 nautical miles from Taiwan itself. Instead, they fly into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And an air defense identification zone does not actually have any legal status. It doesn't confer any jurisdiction. It's simply an area that any country can declare um, in which they insist, but don't always get, um, that other countries' aircraft identify themselves. And the point of an air defense identification zone is to reduce the need to scramble fighter planes to identify potentially hostile aircraft flying close to your airspace. And as you can see, the Taiwanese air defense identification zone actually extends onto the mainland. Now, the Taiwanese don't fly interception missions over the mainland. Uh, they don't, in fact, actually cross the median line between the mainland and the island of Taiwan. Um, but uh, they do scramble whenever the Chinese send aircraft uh, into the air defense identification zone uh, too close for comfort to Taiwan. And the Chinese, as you saw from the previous slide, have been um, periodically flying large numbers of aircraft to try to signal their displeasure with what Taiwan and others are doing. Now, it's important to try to get into the heads of the Chinese leadership on the Taiwan issue here, and it's difficult. <clears throat> There's a wide variety of informed opinion on what's actually going on and what uh, Xi Jinping wants, needs, fears, or believes. There's one view that I've articulated it already in part that Xi Jinping wants to go down in history as the fellow who brought Taiwan back into the fold of the People's Republic. Uh, there is quite a different view that suggests that mostly what Xi Jinping wants is for nothing bad to happen. And so his primary, his only goal really, is to try to deter Taiwan from going too far in asserting its independence or other countries recognizing that independence. Uh, I honestly can't tell you which is right. 
because I'm not inside Xi Jinping's head. But I do think it's wise to hedge against both possibilities. And what would hedging against both possibilities mean? It would mean, uh, for example, that one should be careful not to do anything too provocative that would um, make it impossible for Xi Jinping to save face domestically with an audience that shares his own commitment to the view that Taiwan is in fact the province of China and rightfully belongs in the People's Republic. So that's on the one hand, you don't want to do anything that would actually force his hand into taking strong action against Taiwan. On the other hand, you don't want to be too conciliatory or too soft for fear that he might actually think Taiwan would not have any significant material support in the event of the Chinese attempt to retake it by force. So there's a fine line to balance here. And the trick is making, doing your best to ensure that military action against Taiwan is not terribly attractive to Xi Jinping, um, but at the same time, not abandoning Taiwan, you know, not inadvertently signaling that Taiwan uh, is fair game for Chinese military action. So that's, that's what I would suggest is the trick. There's, there's limits on the empathy we can have with Xi Jinping when it comes to Taiwan. And so we have to actually hedge our bets and play both possibilities as well as we possibly can by walking that fine line that I talked about. How about the South China Sea? Uh, here, I wanna suggest there's a very, very different story. There is no doubt that the Chinese want Taiwan. The only question is, is there any point at which they feel they will be in a position to take it. In the South China Sea, in contrast, we have a prominent international narrative suggesting that China is aggressive and expansionistic and is uh, flouting international law. And this is a narrative that almost nobody disagrees with except uh, yours truly and a small number of other people. Uh, who I'm acquainted with, uh, but it's, it's a lonely crowd. And the story in the South China Sea, very, very complicated, but I wanna see if I can communicate to you why I have a very different view than most others do. And the story goes like this. China staked quite expansive claims to the South, to, to territories in the South China Sea right after World War II. Uh, in fact, it was the Republic of China, the nationalist government, before they lost the Civil War to the communists that began staking out these claims. And in 1947, the uh, nationalist government of the Republic of China published a map with what at the time was an 11 dashed line uh, indicating what territorial features in the South China Sea, they considered to be Chinese. And you see these uh, territorial features uh, in yellow on this map, and you see the 11 dash line in red, although you'll notice if you look carefully that this one only has uh, nine dashes. And that's because when the People's Republic of China took over on the mainland, they actually just inherited the um, nationalist claim to the South China Sea dropped a couple of lines from the map because they settled a border, a maritime border dispute with Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin. But the problem is that uh, while the government of Taiwan still claims all these territorial features, they haven't changed their tune there. The government of Taiwan made clear that they understood the nine dash line only to be sort of encapsulating territorial claims, not maritime ones. And these are two very different things. You can either claim that uh, certain land is yours, or you can claim that uh, you have jurisdiction over the waters that extend from land that is yours. And the problem uh, today and for decades now has been that the People's Republic of China has not 
clearly set that the nine dash line is only a cartographic convenience delineating territorial claims. If given the very strong impression that the nine dash line is meant to uh, assert maritime claims. And if that were the case, then almost the entire South China Sea would be in effect a Chinese lake. So that's what most people believe the Chinese think that the South China Sea is in some sense a Chinese lake. And the Chinese trot out uh, a variety of uh, low quality historical and legal arguments to try to justify uh, fairly expansive maritime claims in the South China Sea. But whether those actually amount to a claim to the entire body of water within the nine dash line, that's doubtful because they've never said that in so many words. Um, a lot of countries claim territory in the South China Sea. This map shows just the Spratly Islands, which is the southernmost group of features in the South China Sea. And if you look very carefully at this, I know it's difficult to see, but I apologize for that. Uh, China, Malaysia, Taiwan, Vietnam, and the Philippines all control some of the features in the South China Sea. In fact, Taiwan controls the only sort of decent quality feature that would be uh, Itu Aba. And uh, they don't control anything else, even though they claim everything else. Uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines each control quite a few features in the South China Sea. China only controls seven, and the seven that it controls were in their natural condition, a relatively low quality. And to make up for that, one of the things China has done in recent years has been to sort of build up their territorial um, possessions in the Spratly Islands effectively making artificial islands by massive uh, dredging and uh, landfill and land reclamation projects. Uh, China has also asserted control of uh, Scarborough Shoal, which is not in the Spratlys, uh, but it's close to the Philippines. And of course, Philippine fishers have been fishing those waters for centuries and uh, now feel unjustly shut out by Chinese Coast Guard forces. And as a result of uh, rather dramatic efforts by the Chinese to improve their position in the South China Sea, the Philippines decided to go to court. Turns out that China is actually a party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, negotiated in 1982. China signed and then ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, as I will call it, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so did the Philippines. They're both parties to this. In fact, all of the major claimants to features in the South China Sea are parties to UNCLOS. Most countries in the world are parties to UNCLOS. What UNCLOS did was it actually swept aside all previous maritime law and replaced sort of the hodgepodge of local traditions, practices, claims, rules with a single unified set of maritime entitlements. And this is important. It's got nothing to do with territorial claims. It's all about maritime claims. And it's not necessary to get into the gory details of what UNCLOS said about maritime claims, but it's worth noting that uh, there are a few different kinds of maritime zones that the uh, convention established, set out the terms and conditions for. Most important of these is the territorial sea. This extends 12 nautical miles from one's coast and the territorial sea is effectively fully sovereign maritime space. So any country that has a territorial sea uh, enjoys all the kinds of sovereign rights and privileges that they would over land. There's an additional 12 miles extending from the territorial sea called the contiguous zone. And UNCLOS allows uh, countries to assert certain kind of police functions in this area. The main purpose of the contiguous zone is to enforce things like pollution laws, uh, customs laws, anti-trafficking laws. Um, you have to be able to do a degree of hot pursuit if you're going to protect your territorial sea and that's what the contiguous zone is all about. But the other really important category is the exclusive economic zone. And normally this would be 200 nautical miles 
from one's coastline. And within the exclusive economic zone, uh, you're the only country that's got the right to explore fish, pump oil and gas, that kind of thing. So for economic purposes, it's functionally sovereign territory. You can give other countries permission to fish in the exclusive economic zone. And even if you want to, you can give them permission to drill for oil and gas in it, but that's unlikely to happen. Most countries are pretty jealous about that kind of thing. Um, but these three categories of things all had very detailed specifications about you know, how you determine what territorial feature is entitled to a territorial sea or a contiguous zone or an exclusive economic zone, and uh, how you actually draw the lines when sovereign territory of different countries is too close together for any kind of nice, neat 12, 24, or 200 nautical mile arrangement. So what the Philippines did was it went to the uh, permanent court of arbitration and asked for a tribunal to be convened to answer a series of questions about the Spratly Islands and Scarborough Shoal. And these were very clever questions. And for the most part, they were quite simple. Um, the most important questions were, first of all, does the People's Republic of China's nine dash line have any status under international law. They also asked whether various features, territorial features in the Spratly Islands and Scarborough Shoal qualified as islands or only as rocks or low tide elevations. And again, UNCLOS goes into gory detail about the difference between an island, a rock, and a low tide elevation. Uh, the key point is that an island is above water at high tide and is capable of sustaining um, human habitation. A rock is above water at high tide, but is not capable of sustaining human habitation. And a low tide elevation is actually submerged at high tide. It's only exposed partly at low tide. And these kinds of features have different maritime entitlements. Uh, only an island gets an exclusive economic zone in addition to a territorial sea and a contiguous zone. A rock only gets a territorial sea and a contiguous zone. And a low tide elevation gets nothing. Uh, artificial islands get nothing. If, if you build an artificial island on what was a fully submerged reef, uh, you have not suddenly created a range of maritime entitlements. So the Philippines asked uh, the tribunal a range of questions about which uh, features in the Spratly Islands were islands, rocks, and low tide elevations. And one of the key findings of the tribunal's ruling was that there are no islands in the Spratlys. And South and Scarborough Shoal also is not an island. Uh, there are only rocks and low tide elevations, which meant that it's not possible to claim an exclusive economic zone from any of the territorial features of uh, the Spratlys or Scarborough Shoal. And that means that even if some of those features are in fact sovereign Chinese territory, uh, there's no way for China to claim an exclusive economic zone that projects more than 200 nautical miles from its own mainland, uh, which is a much smaller proportion of the South China Sea than the Chinese nine dash line maps would indicate the Chinese uh, might potentially claim. I'll leave aside at the moment the question of whether the Paracel Islands are in fact sovereign Chinese territory. They are also disputed. Vietnam claims them as well. Uh, but in any case, it's clear from the Philippines Arbitration Tribunal ruling that China has no basis for claiming extensive maritime jurisdiction in the South China Sea. The Nine Dash Line doesn't provide it. China's bogus arguments about historical rights don't provide it because they're flatly inconsistent with the UN Convention. So the tribunal ruling in 2016 was a massive win for the Philippines in their um, arguments against China asserting control of um, much of the South China Sea and in particular denying the Philippines access to features that were, for example, within their own exclusive economic zone. China rejected the ruling. So they publicly said that it was of no status or effect that the tribunal was illegitimate and it proclaimed its uh, indifference to the ruling. 
So the general impression has been that China thinks it still has all kinds of rights that it clearly does not have because the tribunal said so. And because the general impression is that China is still hell bent as it were on asserting claims that it cannot justify, uh, the United States in particular has been conducting what are called uh, freedom of navigation operations or phone ops <clears throat> against Chinese occupied features. <clears throat> And the purpose of a phone op is to physically demonstrate that you do not recognize another country's claims to jurisdiction in a maritime space. And it mostly involves sailing military ships or perhaps flying military vessels, uh, military aircraft uh, within 12 nautical miles of something you don't think is entitled to a territorial sea or within 200 nautical miles of something that you don't think is entitled to an exclusive economic zone and so on. And as you can see from this chart, the United States began these freedom of navigation operations against uh, various features in the South China Sea in 2015. During the Trump administration, they ramped up uh, dramatically. They've at least temporarily declined a bit under the Biden administration, but it's still early in 2022. For the most part, the Americans target features, Chinese features in the Spratly Islands and Chinese uh, controlled features in the Paracel Islands. Occasionally they'll sail a freedom of navigation operation up by Scarborough Shoal. <clears throat> Once in 2020, they sailed one against Vietnam. We thought the Vietnamese were making maritime claims that could not be justified. It's important to note that American phone ops uh, don't deliberately target just China. They will conduct these operations against anybody that they think makes unjustified maritime claims. And in fact, uh, the United States has conducted phone ops against Canada because the United States does not recognize certain Canadian maritime claims. So it's friends as well as potential foes that can be subject to these freedom of navigation operations. The key point for the moment is China reacts very badly to these. Uh, and China says outright, and in my view probably actually believes that they're dangerous, that they court instability, that you know, the risk of conflict as a result of a freedom of navigation operation uh, goes up. And here's the kicker. Here's where my view departs from almost everyone else. If you look very carefully, you will notice that although China denounced the 2016 Philippines Arbitration Tribunal ruling, it is almost fully complying with it. In other words, it's doing really quite a good job of technically not being offside. <clears throat> so it's, but it's abiding by the rules in effect without actually acknowledging the, that the rules are legitimate. It's stopped building artificial islands. It's quietly stopped talking about the nine dash line, just does not appear in official documents or communications anymore. So they've just let that go. They no longer actively try to enforce maritime jurisdiction more than 12 nautical miles from features that they claim. <clears throat> and while they've built fancy military infrastructure on uh, all seven of their artificial islands in the Spratlys, um, the purpose of those, the main purpose of those, in my view, was to actually allow them to operate an air defense identification zone in the South China Sea, which they've scrapped. At least they've shelved it. Plans were available, they were worked out, um, but an air defense identification zone was not actually feasible if they didn't have airfields in the Spratly Islands from which they could fly <coughs> sorties to intercept unidentified aircraft. Interestingly, they've also never yet even landed a military aircraft on any of the three long runways they built in the Spratly Island. So that's quite a remarkable signal of restraint. So they're keeping their nose clean legally, but at the same time, they're not going away. So China is continuing to use its extensive maritime militia these are what are supposedly fishing boats that are basically manned by 
unofficial military forces, using their maritime militia to maintain a very high level of presence throughout the South China Sea. So the Chinese are kind of everywhere. They've been aggressively signaling to other countries not to develop oil and gas resources. And on at least two occasions, they may have been issuing behind the scenes threats to countries, you know, that if they developed oil and gas resources in what are even their own exclusive economic zones, um, China might take military action. It's hard to know whether there those have been happening. Uh, one of those threats allegedly took place in a private conversation between Xi Jinping and Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. Um, of course, Xi Jinping has full plausible deniability because nobody witnessed it. <clears throat> there's no record of it. Uh, there's an Indonesian report of a Chinese official making a threat uh, in case Indonesia tried to develop oil and gas resources in um, the southernmost part of the South China Sea. But again, that's not been confirmed. So it may or may not be happening. So what's going on there? Why, why is China sort of behaving, but then, not, but then not making it obvious that it's behaving or even still kind of asserting itself indirectly, but not illegally? The key to understanding this dynamic is that the regime went out on a limb and let the Chinese people come to believe that the South China Sea is effectively Chinese. But when the Philippines arbitration ruling came down, it became clear that that's not the case. So the regime had a choice between admitting legal defeat and suffering a humiliating loss of face domestically, where its legitimacy depends fundamentally upon its claim to be able to defend Chinese sovereignty and China's rights, or to become an outlaw and to effectively say, we do not, uh, we no longer recognize the authority of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And um, China actually depends upon international law in many, many ways. It's very important for the you know, welfare of China, its economic stability, um, that the international environment in which China operates is stable and predictable. And of course, international law is a very important part of that stability and predictability. <clears throat> so it was, uh, China was caught between a rock and a hard place. And the solution was, again, to walk this kind of tightrope, to pretend that it had lost nothing legally, but actually to try to stay on side as much as possible with the arbitration ruling. Uh, the problem is that certain other countries might do certain things that undermine Beijing's ability to walk that tightrope, to make it obvious that they either have to admit legal defeat or they have to go full outlaw. Um, so, for example, if Vietnam or the Philippines starts drilling for oil in what the Chinese people think are Chinese waters, and Beijing does nothing, that would look very much like Beijing not defending what the Chinese people think are Chinese rights, even though they're not. Or one of the artificial islands China built is uh, in on Mischief Reef, which as a result of the Philippines arbitration decision, very clearly falls within the Philippines exclusive economic zone. And so only the Philippines had any right to build an artificial island there. So at any point, uh, Manila could go to Beijing and say, get out, here's an eviction notice. You have 12 months, 18 months to evacuate Mischief Reef. That would be the same dilemma for Beijing. They would either have to say, okay, and acknowledge that they've lost uh, at the legal, um, uh, lost at the uh, Philippines Arbitration Tribunal or they would have to go full outlaw and say, no, we're going to stay, it's ours. And that would effectively be declaring China no longer respecting the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. If it came to that, by the way, my money would be on the latter. I think China, I think the regime is more sensitive to domestic opinion than it is to international opinion. But uh, I hope we don't go there because that could be a very, very dangerous situation. 
if I'm right about what's going on in the South China Sea, uh, the moral of the story is that China has painted itself into a corner. It's actually playing defense, not offense. The aggressive expansionist China narrative is uh, not up to date, if, even if that had been accurate, say eight, nine, 10, 12 years ago, it's less accurate, well, it's not accurate today. Uh, China simply doesn't want anything bad to happen. So we don't have much empathy. The international community does not have much empathy with China on the South China Sea. And uh, of course, I'm claiming that I do, <laughs> but, and I could be wrong, like uh, nobody bats a thousand, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. Very hard for me to persuade people though. I once had an hour long conversation with a very senior American official who's in charge of this file. And I laid out all my reasons for thinking that China is actually playing defense, not offense in the South China Sea. And at the end of this hour long conversation, he turned to me and he said, that's very interesting, David. I don't believe you. <laughs> okay, why the lack of empathy? Well, there's lots of reasons why people do not succeed in cultivating empathy. One is just lack of information. If you don't have the information you need to obtain empathy, you won't have empathy. Another important, Factor, and I think this is key in the South China Sea case, is what I like to call the pride and prejudice syndrome. And it's a, it's a fact that belief systems tend to be rigid. Uh, it's well established in cognitive psychology that once we, that we form beliefs relatively easily on the basis of relatively little information. But once we form the belief, we resist changing it. So we have kind of a double standard. We require more information to change a belief than we did to establish it in the first place. And uh, so the aggressive China narrative took root very quickly between 2012 and 2016 because of China's energetic island building campaign and a variety of other very assertive things China did in the South China Sea. So that once that took root, it stuck. And so we, people just haven't noticed that China has suddenly begun behaving interestingly differently. I call this the Pride and Prejudice Syndrome because of Jane Austen's famous novel in which the heroine, Elizabeth Bennet, decides very early in the novel on the basis of a very brief encounter, uh, just a few minute encounter with Mr. Darcy that Mr. Darcy is a jerk. Um, and it takes the whole rest of the novel for her to change her mind. Mountain of discrepant information before she will change her mind. This is typical of the way we form and then hesitantly revise our beliefs about anything. A third obstacle to empathy is the fundamental attribution error. And uh, this is the tendency to think that people we don't like who do things that we don't like do so because of their disposition, because of the kind of people they are, they're bad people. We don't tend to think they do things we don't like because of their situational constraints. That they had no choice, that they were forced, something like that. In contrast, when people we like do something we don't like, and we don't tend to think that it reflects on their character. So when Americans see China doing something that uh, Americans don't like, they, they think it's dispositional. They think it reflects uh, intentionality. And it might just be circumstantial constraints. My story about what's really going on in the South China Sea is a story about circumstantial constraints. And another source is the egocentric bias. So when people do things we don't like, we tend to overestimate the likelihood that they had us in mind. Uh, maybe they didn't, maybe they had somebody else in mind. Maybe they didn't have anybody in mind. Um, again, maybe it was just some, just some situational set of circumstances that forced them to do something that we don't like. But we're not necessarily always the target. It's not necessarily deliberately aimed at us. But we have a tendency to assume that it is. And so all the rival claimants in the South China Sea tend to interpret everything China does that they don't like as deliberately targeting them. Again, that's, that's a bias. That's not necessarily the case, but we tend to leap to that conclusion. How do you cultivate empathy where you're lacking it? How do you build it? Well, it's very important to talk. 
And in international politics, one of the best ways of cultivating empathy is actually to have dialogues. They could be bilateral, they could be multilateral. And in my view, some of the most fruitful dialogues don't take place between officials directly. That would be track one, official contacts. Lots of reasons for that. It's because people you know, have to maintain a public position. They can't afford to be you know, sharing too much information, can't afford to be seen to be sharing too much information. Um, also, officials tend to be very competent in their own understandings of things. They're usually alpha males, occasionally alpha female, usually alpha males. Uh, tend to think they're right about anything in every way. So they're not necessarily open-minded enough to learn much in a dialogue with another foreign leader. But if you get academics talking to other academics from another country, that's track two. Academics are paid to be curious. We're paid to discover things. We don't, not always open-minded, but at least we're professionally more likely to be able to listen to somebody else's point of view and change our mind about something. So a track two dialogue can actually result in very good quality sharing of information. And then you, know, you have your conversation with your academic colleagues in another country, you go home and you share what you've learned with your officials. Maybe that'll percolate up into some better quality decision-making. Track 1.5 is just a dialogue setting in which you've got some officials there in an unofficial capacity as well as non-officials like academics. <coughs> And there are team A, team B exercises. So this is something intelligence communities do when they're trying to figure out what another country's leadership group is thinking or doing or wants or what they're likely to do. They'll often task two different groups of people to explore two very different possibilities. So team A will look at the you know, aggressive China hypothesis for the South China Sea and team B will look at the playing defense, not offense perspective on China in the South China Sea. And then they'll come back and they'll having worked up detailed analyses of both possibilities and they'll have a conversation about them and try to reach a conclusion about which of those if either one provides the better account for what's happening. Then you can get official and academic exchanges. Uh, you can you know, send officials to go spend several months in the other country and get to know people and network and think and learn and read. We do it with academics. They can do that as well. That's often a very good way to cultivate empathy. Uh, and then of course there's espionage <laughs> and nobody likes to talk about this. Nobody officially likes to talk about this but it happens all the time. Almost every country will devote resources to trying to, you know, effectively spy on everybody else, friends and folks. Like information is power. So the more information you have about other countries, the better off you are. And I'm sure there's lots of efforts in that um, vein on all sides, both with, with respect to Taiwan and the South China Sea. Finally, let me circle back to the question I started with. Well, what then can Canada and Japan do <clears throat> given everything I've said already? And I'll start with Taiwan. If the goal is to try to walk a fine line, hedge your bets, because we don't really have adequate empathy on Xi Jinping, what the Chinese leadership plans to do with Taiwan, uh, You've got to make sure that you make uh, military action as unattractive as possible without triggering it, without provoking it. And at the same time, you have to be careful not to misleadingly give the impression that military action is costless, or at least uh, the benefits would outweigh the costs. So I think there are a variety of things Canada and Japan could do together and doing them together is important here because united fronts, multilateral efforts are more impressive to China than unilateral efforts. More impressive to any country, but China especially because China as a big powerful country can pick off individual countries one-on-one -on -one. almost always 
wins in the power matchup when you're doing sort of comparisons just between China and one other country. But if Canada and Japan and Australia and the United States and South Korea and a range of other countries, however many you can get, can sort of jointly do things uh, that help manage this hedging strategy, that's more impressive. What do these include? Well, boosting military cooperation. Canada and Japan have limited military cooperation at the moment. There are agreements in place designed to help improve the military cooperation. There will probably be opportunities in the future to cooperate more actively. These should all be energetically pursued. So the more Canada and Japan can improve their military cooperation, in my view, the better. Secondly, quietly signal a willingness to help defend Taiwan if China attacks. Now, the important word here is quietly. You don't want to come out with a very public statement by a prime minister saying, we will defend Taiwan against the tech. That would basically be encouraging Taiwan to declare formal independence. Um, I actually think Taiwan is too smart to do that. So that may not be as much of a risk as I've just made it sound. But in any case, if you can quietly signal, then you don't push Beijing into a corner here. You don't make the regime lose face, but you get the message across that uh, it's not gonna be easy, that there would be resistance and it would be multilateral and it would be international resistance to a military move against Taiwan. Third thing uh, Japan and Canada can both do is help embed Taiwan further into various regional arrangements. And one of the most important of these, I think the easy one to do uh, would be the uh, CPTPP. Um, that's the, uh, the modern version, the new version of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Canada and Japan are both members. Taiwan has asked to become a member. Uh, China is working very hard to try to dissuade the other members of CPTPP to accept Taiwan as a member. And China is even now talking about seeking membership itself, possibly to preempt Taiwanese membership in the CPTPP. I think Canada and Japan should both immediately, frankly, uh, cut bilateral trade deals with Taiwan that are basically on the terms of the CPTPP. So that trade between all three countries uh, could take place on terms exactly like trade between any other two CPTPP members. So that would be like de facto membership. And I suspect that if Canada and Japan did that, other members would probably jump on board because they wouldn't want Canada and Japan to have preferential trade arrangements with Taiwan. It's a very important country. Fourth, uh, boost the track 1.5 and track two dialogues. Uh, Keep talking, talk multilaterally, talk bilaterally with each other and trilaterally with Taiwan, but keep the conversations going about Taiwan's importance to the global economy, Taiwan's strategic importance, the importance of defending Taiwanese democracy and so forth and so on. Uh, just keep those conversations going and make sure that Beijing knows about them. And then parliamentary exchanges. That's a relatively mild signal of international support, but it's a pretty powerful one, um, given that it's you know it's not leader to leader exchange, but you know, parliamentary exchanges definitely communicate a degree of commitment. We saw recently a good example: European politicians traveling to Taiwan, basically as a show of support. How about the South China Sea? Here again, I think it's, it's a different set of challenges. And the important thing is for Canada and Japan to try to do what they can to keep things getting out of control, to keep a, a stumble pathway from developing, or to keep a pull pathway developing. That's not gonna directly affect Canada or Japan because neither country has any alliance with any of the South China Sea claimants. Um, but the Philippines, for example, is a formal ally of the United States. And the Philippines uh, found itself in a fight with China. Arguably, they could call upon the United States to come to their defense. And that, that could 
spin out of control. So how do you do this? How do you sort of keep the lid on, but keep a firm stiff spine, I should say, about uh, the importance of international law? Maintain a naval presence. Canada and Japan do occasionally and should continue occasionally sending naval vessels through the South China Sea, just to signal that we acknowledge it as international waters. So naval presence, but not phone ops. Let the Americans do the phone ops. Um, no particular reason for anybody else to do it. And the Americans are doing it anyway. One of the downsides to Canada conducting a phone op in the South China Sea, for example, would be it would almost certainly trigger relatively quickly a Chinese phone op through the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic. And uh, we don't want a tit for tat response on that issue. So yeah, naval presence, but not phone outs. Again, boost the track 1.5 uh, or two conversations uh, with uh, all of the countries in the region. And Canada used to be very active in these and sadly has sort of dropped out of them in recent years, but it shouldn't be too difficult to get back in on them. Third thing Canada and Japan can do is boost functional cooperation with claimant states in the South China Sea, just to demonstrate our value and our interest and our commitment. And these in particular might include things like search and rescue and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. These are things that both Canada and Japan are quite good at and that other countries could use our expertise and help on. So ramp that up. <clears throat> and of course, always treat the Philippines arbitration decision as settled law. Uh, don't let anyone have any doubts about Canada's and Japan's commitments to the rule of law as far as UNCLOS and, and other international law is concerned. So lots to do, uh, plenty of room for improved cooperation between Canada and Japan. I'm sure there is quite a lot of willingness, a lot of goodwill in Canada-Japan relations. But uh, as I've said, lots of room for growth, lots of room for deepening security cooperation. I think this is a really important opportunity both Taiwan and South China Sea, really important opportunities to do that. And that's it for me. I uh, hope that was interesting and I hope it was valuable. Um, but in any case, thank you for your attention.